The other part that I really want to talk about is the the communication part. I've, I've heard you yeah. talk about in a previous talk, like how important that is, not just the finding, but how you share that yes. to the world. Yes. And so in this case, what's the process of, you, you, you talked about that, you alluded to, if it's something big, you, you might want to share it to the press. What's the, the decision process about that? And then I'd love to talk about actually doing that and sharing and talking with journalists and sharing it to the public? Sure. Uh, that's another great question. And I would say that the mode of communication affects how you communicate it. And so if it's a conversation or an interview with a journalist, you know, in my case, I contacted the journalist said, hey, I think that this is important. Uh, you might want to run a story on this. Here's the information. And then in that case, I talked to the journalist, and then I also provided the journalist with background information that I had produced that I was allowed to release to, to him to say, Here, here's what we've what we found. So here's the here's the backup information. Here's the information that supports what I'm saying. So you can take my interview, but then here's some background information to to show you the evidence. Um, so that's one way of communicating. Um, but then Really, any form of communication that's going to be public in any way, you need to take very a, a great deal of care in the words that you use to describe what you're observing. Um, different words mean different things, and you want to make sure that you're very careful in in making in making it clear just how certain you are about what you're saying. Like um, that that gets into words like caveat or probability like we think this is if you've ever heard a language like this this is a probable truck you're like what is a probable truck that doesn't make any sense it's just a truck or it's not a truck right well no if you're le if you're dealing with remote sensing data you will want to make it clear to your audience this is what i think this is and i'm going to show you a picture of it but it's just three blue pixels but it's just three blue, pi blue pixels and here's my level of confidence in what i'm saying that it is and if it's just three blue pixels, you might want to be really careful in trying to go public with that because one aspect of communication uh, that I, I think you're starting to allude to is, is how do people get convinced that what you're saying is right? Now, that's both the strength of satellite imagery and the weakness of satellite imagery. The strength is that people can relate to a picture very quickly. If I say, this is a truck, and it kind of looks like a truck from the top view, you say, yeah, yeah, that is a truck. I've just communicated something to you, an observation, and you now agree with it. That's quite powerful. I mean, that's a simple example, a truck. But if it's a truck at a nuclear weapons underground facility, I mean, you can just start piling on the different meanings there. Then it can become quite a big deal. Then it's more than just a truck. Um, but that's also the weakness of satellite imagery because it can sometimes too easily convince people of things because it's so easy to visually make sense of certain images, especially electro optical images. You know, just um, so you have to be very careful when you're communicating that you respect both. You respect the strength of it and not you're not trying to trick people. I would say you have to be responsible. And then account for the weakness, uh, which is if you're wrong and you've convinced people and you've done it in part because you're using this very convincing picture, uh, then, you know, that's a problem. You don't want to do that. You shouldn't want to do that. <laughs> you don't want to be presenting bad information, disinformation, which might be accidental or misinformation where you're intentionally misleading people. And there are lots of current examples of that. Uh, so one, one quick example is the new missile silo fields. I don't know if you talked with Jeffrey Lewis about this, but his organization, um, you know, the Middlebury Institute, put out some publications about China's new missile silo fields in different parts of the country. There are now three major new ones. Um, and they did, they did some good work on that. Uh, well, at the time the first report came out, I think it was with Washington Post, I believe a prominent... Chinese Foreign Service officer put out on Twitter a claim that those were not missile silo fields. In fact, they were windmills. China was building windmills. This is a wind farm, a wind generation farm. 
So that official's statement on Twitter would be an example of misinformation, taking something that people might be able to see visually and say, well, that's not a missile silo field that that they're building windmills there, intentionally trying to mislead the public with that information. I, I can say intentionally because we, we also study this. We had a customer that hired us to study that and actually test that exact claim to say, are these windmill fields or missile silos? And we did a full analysis and said, well, they're definitely not windmills. <laughs> and we think they're probably missile silos in accordance with you know, multiple other organizations as well. Hey, if you like this, you can actually listen to the full interview right here. Otherwise, I'll catch you next time. Cheers.